Good morning, everyone. So um, th thanks for thanks for coming again today. I'll start, you know, again in just a minute to, because people are probably going to be a little bit late. Or so today, today I'm going to talk. About, oh, so okay, but right, sorry, logistics. So in the same directory that I posted Mondays and Tuesdays uh, slides and exercises, I posted today's slides and some exercises related to the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Um, again, there's going to be office hours at three. Yesterday, I ran late to that, and that was uh, sorry about that. So today, I'm going to check in at actually at, at three or like within a minute or two. And if you you know if you find that I'm not there, um, please reach out to me on, on Slack or email or something. So um, today, we're going to talk about a construction called the finite path integral. So if you've heard about the path integral, you may have heard it spoken in hushed tones as like this this mathematically illegal thing that the, that the physicists do, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a setting in which you can actually do it, you know, and produce a topological theory. And so this puts pretty strong constraints on what can actually happen. In particular, you know, if you're if you're doing this for a gauge theory, your gauge group is finite. Um, if the, if the, if these words make sense, great. If not, everything will be explained in due time. But the point is, this gives a whole bunch of examples of topological field theories, which are not just the invertible field theories we talked about last time, and. You know, we we can we can say some interesting properties about them, such as what are their um, what what are their state spaces, and what are their um, what what's the values of their partition functions on various manifolds. And um, some of these go by names such as uh, dijkraff witten theories, which is a, a, a collection of commonly studied examples. Yetter's model, uh, Quinn's finite homotopy TFT, um, Turayev's hom homotopy quantum field theory, which is a big word for a concept that is that is not so scary, in my opinion. So, um, so first, I'm going to. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start by reviewing what we um, what we need from yesterday's lecture. So, yesterday was a little bit more categorical or more homotopical than today. So, for people who weren't there or who were there but but didn't didn't get what they what they wanted out of it, I'm just going to review. Okay, we need a couple pieces, and that's all we're going to start with. Then I'm going to say a little bit about what this construction is trying to model. You know, it's, it, I'm not really going to get into the physics, but you know, that here, here are some features that, that a um, that path integral quantization has, and then we're going to build something similar. But then I'm going to define the, uh, the finite path integral as a process for obtaining, starting with one TFT, with some extra data, such as a principal G bundle, using up that data by summing over it, and then producing another TFT that doesn't depend on that data. Then I'm going to go into some examples. So these examples, I'm going to say fairly quickly, because once you understand the general construction, the examples in principle are not so hard. As for actually making calculations, that, that's part of the exercises. And then I should have said in point five, I'm going to talk about some applications that aren't actually examples. So this is time dependent, but you can do some cool stuff. You know, you can do some cool tricks with the, with the finite path integral. So um, as an example, there's a nifty construction of the direct sum of topological field theories that, um, you know, you can construct it by hand, which was one of Monday's exercises. But this construction works better if you if you cared about the direct sum of like extended TFTs or TFTs in an infinity categorical setting or something. And there's two other things. So I will I will say those, or if I run out of time, they will be in the slides. And as always, please do not hesitate to ask me questions whenever you have them. Um, either in chat, which I which I am monitoring, or um, or just uh, directly. Okay, cool. We are recording. Glad to be, glad to see that. So, without further ado, so the point of of all of this stuff, you know, I'm trying to make this whole week focused on examples that that you might not have really gotten your hands on in other introductions to TFT. So people who are like, aha, you know, here's the Cobertson hypothesis. You just need a fully dualizable object in a symmetric middle infinity n category. Well, okay, so the cobordism hypothesis is very good, but that can be a little bit inexplicit. And there's also the opposite side where it's like the, the, the you know, semi-simple Frobenius algebra, bam, 2D topological field theory, which is very explicit, but somehow those examples are not always as interesting as, as what people study in general. And so the hope is that the lecture, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday's lectures, these examples are going to um, give, you, give you stuff to play with. So 
I, th I think it, it, you know, we don't have very, I don't think we have any general theorems above dimension two, like, okay, well, what does an arbitrary TFT look like? Do the constructions we have see most of them, uh, except for like state sum ones maybe, or the cobordism hypothesis where that's tautologically true. But I think it's generally believed that most things are not finite path integral TFT. So these are somehow an, a nice class of examples that aren't too terrifying, but um, they're, they're, still, they're still pretty versatile. And importantly, you know, the, these examples are, are interesting enough to, well, to be interesting, the part, and they can be, um, they can be calculated explicitly on, for example, partitions, functions, and state spaces. On manifolds with boundary, these can be a little bit um, annoying. And um, crucially, yesterday's invertible field theory examples require thinking through some homotopy theory. And what we're going to do today is going to require less. Like, we're not going to use the full force of those results. So let me review what we need. So a bordism invariant is an, is an abelian group homomorphism from a bordism group to C star. So this H should be xi, you know, a xi structure. I used this notation because I was thinking of H as a Lie group, but um, you know, this should be this should be xi. And so the point is, if you have a bordism invariant, then it, then it lifts to an invertible topological field theory, um, which recovers the bordism invariant as its partition function. Um, in fact, you can use sl something slightly. Uh, uh, more general, an SKK boardism invariant, which gets you, among other things, the Euler characteristic. And so good examples of boardism invariants are integrating characteristic classes or natural cohomology classes for manifold with your H structure. Again, side structure is what I should have said. So for example, if you have an arbitrary manifold, maybe you can integrate Stiefel Whitney classes in mod two cohomology, um, take the product until they're in top degree and then integrate them. Um, maybe if you're on an oriented manifold, Maybe you have um, something on like Kuntragen numbers. So here I should clarify that this, this needs to be a torsion element of the group of these things. Um, otherwise, otherwise, there are some problems. Wait. No, sorry. That's not right. That's not right. OK. That's for a different classification. OK, so any bordism invariants are good. And so for example, you have Kuntragen numbers for oriented manifolds. For spin manifolds, you, you have more things. Like you can, you can integrate things taking place in, in a real K theory. And so th those give you index theoretical invariants, which, which can define topological field theories. So um, sometimes you can use twisted cohomology. The point is integrating characteristic classes or just natural cohomology classes that you have around give you good examples of boardism invariants and therefore you know, these invertible topological field theories. Um, before I go on, any questions? OK. So we're going to talk about briefly about path integral quantization in a very heuristic way. So, I'm, so we're going to consider a gauge theory in physics. And so what that means, so when someone says gauge theory, um, well, OK, the mathematicians and the physicists mean two different things. But as a, um, as a physicist, they, they mean, OK, I have, a, I have a field theory, you know, classical or quantum. And one of the fields is a principal G bundle and a connection for it. So if you don't know what, a, what either of those things are, um, a principal G bundle. So you know how a vector bundle is a, it's sort of a family of vector spaces parametrized over, over a base space. And a principal G bundle is sort of like that, but not quite. You might think, oh, it's a, so a, a vector space is sort of a thing acted on by the real numbers or the complex numbers. A principal bundle, you start with things acted on by G. So what, what you do is you take something called a G torsor which is um, a space with a free transitive G action on the right, and a family of those is a principal G bundle. A connection, I'm not going to get into the definition right now. That's, that's geometric information, not topological. And it's a thing that allows you to find parallel transport in the fibers. So if you've seen a little bit of Ramanian geometry, a, um, the levi chavita connection can be explained in terms of a, a connection on a principal ON bundle, which then induces the usual connection on the tangent bundle. So there's, so in some sense, okay, so one of the fields is this data. The space of this data is infinite dimension. It's an inf you know, infinite dimensional affine space. Now, we could also have other fields. And so we're gonna call F the space of all of these fields. Usually it's curly F, but I got the most fun LaTeX error when trying to use curly F, which is called too many math alphabets in version normal. So um, you, can you, you can imagine curling this F. Anyways, there's a space of fields. Sometimes it might be something like a stack, and we're not going to worry about that. Maybe it's just a space. Right? And there's a function, the Lagrangian action, from the space of fields to the real numbers. 
And so the idea of uh, class, you know, classical Lagrangian uh, physics is that this, this function, the system evolves under uh, extremal trajectories. So you minimize or maximize the, the, the action. And those are the things that happen, the, you know, the possible trajectories in phase space. So, um, so this, so this action is important for telling you what's, um, what's going on. And remember the space of fields is infinite dimension in a gauge theory. Well, okay, for a, for a leap, that's not finite or not compact, uh, sorry, not zero dimensional, there we go. So then there's this uh, mysterious principle called quantization. Hey, yeah, question. Let's go. So I, I thought I remembered yesterday you defined the partition function as like this image of one under this yes. map from Good. Z associated the empty set to the, so how do I get an actual function? Uh, this, this? this is not, wait, this, th well, this is not the partition function. No, 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 the partition function, I mean. Like the partition oh, so the, function should be- A function. The function, yeah. Which, okay, so, so- Not just a member, like an element of, of C star. So, I mean, the partition function is, I mean, if you're like in StatMec, the partition function is a number, right? Or is it a function? I don't actually know. So I think when someone says partition function and thinks it is a function, they, they oh, yeah, okay, Saad has it. So the partition, so there is a number associated to every closed end manifold, right? So that's a function right. from closed end manifolds to numbers. That's the partition function. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Saad. This is this is that that's exactly exactly right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I I yeah, sometimes in topological field theory we take physics words and just kind of use them. But in this case, there is a good interpretation. Yeah, good question. Uh, do people have more questions? I was wondering in the previous slide, where did the SKK story go? Is it like how come you, you don't have this twisting anymore? So it it didn't go anywhere in some sense. So uh, SKK boardism invariants are more general than than ordinary boardism invariants, right? So in other words, if you have an ordinary boardism invariant, then you have an SKK invariant, and you know you can you can continue on willy nilly. The all I'm doing is saying you know this this extra this extra twist or this extra detail we're not going to worry about today. Okay, so this is a subclass, something. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you so if you care, if you require your invertible field theories to be unitary, then Dan Fried and Mike Hopkins have this, they have the theorem that the SKK bit goes away and you get torsion ordinary borders invariants. So somehow these are the best ones if you if you care about you know unitary quantum field theory. Great. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Uh, loving all these questions. Are there more questions? Okay, well, you, you, know, you know how to ask if you, have, if you have more questions. So, okay, so quantization is this kind of art process. Um, you know, my advisor likes to say it's, it's an art, not a functor. Sometimes people say it's a functor, but in this case, it's this like mysterious, not always mathematically rigorous procedure. So what we would like to do is we'd like to compute the partition function of the quantum theory on some manifold by exponentiating the action and then integrating over the space of fields. Uh, so d phi, where, uh, so phi is now like some sort of measure on the space of fields, f, and then we, you know, we exponentiate. Maybe there should be a two pi here and uh, that's, you know, that's a detail that I'm gonna sweep under the rug. And so we do this and we get the path integral. So sometimes, for example, it's an integral over paths. Other times it's an integral over, for example, all connections. And so f is typically infinite dimension. So if g is a positive dimensional Lie group, then connections on a principal G bundle form a, um, an infinite dimensional for shape, affine space modeled on a for shape space. So, you know, you can write down a couple desiderata that you want for your measure, D phi, and then prove that it doesn't exist. So um, this is a problem. Large amounts of um, mathematics, physics, and straight up humor has been devoted to this fact. But what we're gonna do is today, we're gonna say none, you know, none of this stuff, we're gonna work on a setting where it does exist. The path integral is a rigorous thing and can be used to give more examples of topological field theories. So we're gonna take the physics, we're gonna set it aside and use this idea, take a classical action, exponentiate, and then integrate over the space of principal G bundles to define topological field theories. So specifically, we're gonna take G to be a finite group. And the reason is that then there's a space of principal G bundles. Okay, well really it's, it's gonna be a groupoid. And that space is, is finite. 
And so it's finite in this homotopical sense where it's, um, there's finitely many connected components and each one has pi one finite and then all higher homotopy groups vanish. Um, and so, so again, this crucially uses the G as a finite group and that we're doing this on compact manifolds. So what you can do is then th there, there's this way of, of imitating what we just saw last slide where you integrate the uh, exponentiated action, where you take a, a beginning TFT, which I'm gonna call Z classical on Xi manifolds equipped with a principal G bundle valued in vector spaces or in super vector spaces. And then you sum over principal G bundles and obtain a new TFT, which only depends on the Xi structure and does not depend on the principal G bundle. And then it has the same target. So vect, or if you like super vector spaces, then super vector spaces. So the original paper that does something like this is uh, Dan Fried and Frank Quinn from uh, 1992, just before I was born. Uh, I think it's called Trin Simon Theory of Finite Gauge Group. And so they really, so, so this one, what we're gonna do is a little bit implicit. So one question you might ask after today's lecture is, okay, I know what happens on closed manifolds. What happens on manifolds with you know, boardisms that, that have non-trivial boundary? And if you wanna understand this, Fried Quinn go into all the detail. So read it there. Then there's this paper of Fried Hopkins, Larry Telebon, uh, topological quantum field theories from compact Lie groups, which does several different things, including this. You know, more, I mean, okay, they sketch a general construction, but their sketch is a good sketch. Uh, there's more work by Morton, Trova, and Schweiger and Voika. Um, disclaimer, I may be forgetting some stuff. Um, I know uh, these two, their, their team and their collaborators do have done a bunch of stuff related to this. So check out their, their collaborators' papers as well, because there's some good stuff that may not literally be the finite pattern rule, but is like worth reading. And so, okay, so take, taking this as a black box for now, examples of, of these uh, classical theories, classical is not a well-defined term, but your starting thing, then performing the finite path integral gives you new examples of TFTs. And for example, typically we're gonna start with an invertible TFT, although we didn't have to. And we're, you know, later today we'll see an example where we didn't. And what we end up with is generally non-invertible. So um, we're, we're sort of leaving the realm that we had yesterday, which is good because, you know, we shouldn't, like the, the goal is for all the lectures to be valuable and not to just repeat. And so a key example, is this, the standard example is dijkraff witten theories. So uh, Dijkraff and Witten wrote this in a paper called Topological Gauge Theories and Group Cohomology, where they were like, we're churn Simon's theory, but what if the group was finite? And so um, they're indexed by, by uh, characteristic classes for principal G bundles. So there's the space BG, the classifying space of G, and we take an n-dimensional R mod Z valued cohomology class, alpha. So if you have a principal G bundle on a manifold, that gives you a map to BG up to homotopy. So you can pull back alpha, and I'm gonna call that alpha of P. And that's an N dimension, a degree N cohomology class of your manifold in R mod Z. So when you integrate it, you get an element of R mod Z. Then exponentiate it, and you get a non-zero complex number, like e to the two pi i, whatever your thing is. And so this is good, because this defines a C star valued boardism invariant, so it categorifies to some invertible field, theory, invertible topological field theory, which is typically called classical digraph theory. That is our ZCL. And then when you perform the finite path integral, you obtain an oriented TFT, generally not invertible, called digraph witten theory. So these are, um, in more conventional introductions to TFT, these, especially when alpha is zero, are some of the first examples you'll see. And they, they, they're, they're good examples to have around. Now, sometimes you might ask, well, what if I worked with more general borders and variants, just characteristic classes? And that, you know, that's an interesting question. So here is another more general example. So this example is originally due to uh, Frank Quinn in these uh, lecture notes on um, topological quantum field theory. And possibly because they're difficult to find online, legally or not, it seems to have been discovered, rediscovered a couple of different places. So um, Turayev writes it down and gives it a different name, and then possibly, I think maybe someone else that I'm forgetting. Anyways, we're gonna generalize the example as follows. So, okay, summing over principal G bundles is really the same thing as summing over maps to BG if you're homotopical enough. And the key thing we needed was this homotopical finiteness of BG, you know, not actual finiteness of G. So if you're looking at it from this like, you know, topsy-turvy Alice in Wonderland homotopy theory view, well then who cares that you have BG? Why don't, why don't you just let, pick a space X, which has the properties you need? And so this, this property is called finite total homotopy. 
all the homotopy groups of X are finite and all, all but finitely many vanish. So then you can perform the finite path integral over maps to X. And this is a, um, I mean, that it's the formally it's the same thing and you know the computations of like what this what the partition function is looks very similar and so you recover like i mentioned in generality if you if you integrate cohomology classes of x the same way that we did for digraph witten theory then this is called quinn's finite homotopy tft if x only has two non-zero homotopy groups um pi one and pi two then this is called the yetter model and so in this case there's this appealing interpretation where x is the classifying space of something called a two group or a categorical group and so there are, th there has been a lot of interesting work recently on these like higher group symmetries in quantum physics. And so this is sort of a very, very simple example where you, where you have a, a two group symmetry in, in sort of a pretty simple way. And then you're summing over, you're, you're like gauging that symmetry. So this is, okay, so this is a very, very general example. It is useful to have this, this example in, in generality. Like you know, th these are good examples of topological field theories. And sometimes you need something that has more than just pi one to prove a theorem. Um, I can say more about that later, but um, lastly, you can also sum over, you don't have to sum over principal bundles or maps to a space X. Some, you can also perform the path integral over things like spin structures or, pin, you know, pin plus or pin minus or whatnot. So that's, an, that, you know, as long, as long as things are finite enough, then that's good. So this is a, um, you know, there's, I think in full generality, what you can sum over, people haven't really written it down. And I don't think, you know, it's just sort of not a, like in ex we, we know what we need in examples, and then the general story is going to proceed similarly. Before I before I uh, sketch the construction, are there any questions? I mean, just to clarify what you're doing here, so you're keeping all of the state spaces fixed, and you're changing the partition function. Is that is that no? No. You're, you, so we're gonna we're gonna modify both the state spaces and the partition functions. Okay, you just haven't told us how to modify the state. Precisely. Space. Yeah. 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 So in some sense, when I say we're summing over principal G bundles in the partition function, that's going to be a weighted actual sum. For state spaces, that's going to be a direct sum. So you're, you're absolutely modifying. As a, as a sort of sanity check, if you know that all the state spaces are one dimensional, then in many cases, you can conclude that your theory is invertible. This is a, this is a theorem of Chris Schomerpreis. Um, in fact, all you need is that it's one dimensional on, on uh, Torah. So this paper, Tori Determined Invertibility of field theory, Topological Field Theories, was written in response as an answer to a math overflow question, which is really cool. And so in order to get a non-invertible field theory, you have to modify state spaces for the most part. What are you calling the state space here? So state space is, so a TFT assigns vector spaces to n minus one manifolds and boardisms, like uh, linear maps to boardisms, right? So the state space is the vector space assigned to an n minus one manifold. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, sorry. I it's this, this, yeah. It's this um, I have another question. Yeah. So great. Questions. This this x here. Mm -hmm. Um, is there some like sigma model thing lurking in Good. the background when we were talking about this? Okay. So yeah, you can think of this as a as a sigma model. So sigma model is physics speak for I have a field theory and one of the fields is a map to a space x. And in general, you like perform the path integral over all these things, and it's like way too big. But we're, you know, since we're doing a uh, you know space with finite total homotopy, and we're summing over homotopy classes of maps, it, or maybe do doing the sum in a homotopical way, then you obtain a topological field theory. Now, I'd like to make a disclaimer, which is that there, Witten has a paper called Topological Sigma Models, or something close to that title, and that is different from this. And so, for that reason, Quinn's, Quinn's TFTs are not called topological sigma models, even though that's what they actually are. But yeah, great question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, more questions. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Please keep asking questions. So, um, Saad, I think this will help answer your question a little better, um, which is like what exactly how we're going to modify both the state space and the part, like just the whole theory. So I'm going to talk about the construction in detail for summing over principal G bundles. And the more general case, I'm, I'm going to wave my hands. Up. And so there are two reasons for that. The first is that principal G bundles is the thing, like by far the most common application of this, you're going to be summing over principal G bundles or something that is essentially the same. So the construction goes through. So like if you want to sum over spin structures, then, okay, a spin structure is not a principal Z2 bundle. 
they're, they're related, but they're not the same. And, but, but if you wanted to carefully write down the path integral for spin structures, you could follow your nose using print the, the theory for principal C2 bundles. So um, the, the second thing is, is the second reason that, that we're going to focus on that case is that the general case, like I'll be honest, is not completely carefully written down. So when I said Quinn's theory, Quinn's finite homotopy TFT is a special case of this, that is not a you know crystalline theory. That is a thing that you know if you know if you know the finite path integral and you've heard of Quinn's theory, then you look at that and you say yes, of course it's true. But in fact, I don't think anyone's actually done it. And I'm not I'm not saying that should be difficult. It's just you have to translate a bunch of stuff that has already been said. Like, I think it would be an exercise level of thing, but it, but the point is it is still not carefully done. And there, there's sort of a more general question of, well, what possible things could I do for the finite path integral? Not just maps to a space X. What if there are anomalies? What if there's like, what if I want to extend? There's all sorts of interesting variants you could think about. And um, so I want I want to make clear that for the most part, it's carefully done for principal G bundles, maybe slightly more generality, but it's known what would have to be changed for the general case, even if it's not written down. Okay, all that out of the way, what we're going to do is we're going to build a functor from using this classical, this uh, Z, Z classical, we're going to go from the borders and category to a category of correspondences. So spans of groupoids equipped with vector bundles. So a span, so let's say I have a category, a span is a, is data of three objects, X, Y, and Z, such that Y maps down to X and Z. And so there's a category of spans where a span X, you know, Y goes to X and Z is interpreted as a morphism from X to, to Z. Composition is pullback. And um, if you want a category rather than a two category, you're gonna have to take isomorphism classes, but we can do that. And this is, so you can sort of think of this as like, kind of like bordisms, right? A bordism is a co-span, you know, the boundaries include into the thing. And so if you take a contravariant functor to bordisms, then you get spans. And so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna build this, this, this category of this uh, category core, and we're gonna use the classical to define this, uh, to, to um, build spans of groupoids equipped with vector bundles out of, um, out of bordisms. So the idea is that given a manifold, we're gonna, we have a, um, we're gonna assign a space of fields to N. And the space is gonna be a groupoid because principal bundles really are a groupoid. There's, there's principal bundles, there's automorphisms, and that's it. Or in, in other language, the space has pi zero and pi one, and that's it. Now, bordisms are going to introduce, uh, they're going to do spans or correspondences of this data. And then the vector bundle comes from saying, okay, I have a, I have a point in this space, really groupoid. And that is a manifold with a principal bundle. So we can apply Z classical to it and obtain a vector space, right? The state space of the classical theory. And when we do that, we're going to get, you know, we have a, um, we have a vector space over each point. And then there's some, there's some question about, okay, well, are these, do these talk to each other when they're nearby? And they do. And therefore, we get a vector bundle. So, okay, great. Um, and then I should mention that this functor is going to be symmetric monoidal, which I'm not going to say too much about, but it is. And then there's quantization. And so quantization in, of this form is simply taking sections of the vector bundle. And so that's a functor from correspondences to um, complex vector spaces. And so you say, okay, I have, a comp I have a vector bundle here. Now I can pull it back across the correspondence and sections will also, um, sorry, I, I can pull back the vector bundle here, but when I go this way, the other leg of the span, I can't do that. So you need a push forward map and that push forward map is going to be summing over the fibers. And so this, this is what, you know, the existence of a push forward map in, in, in general, this is the kind of thing that you, know, you need finiteness of, of your group. And so like in, in people think about, you know, push forwards, in, for example, so David Benzvi lo loves this point of view. And he'll talk about it for like, you know, matrix multiplication and like, you know, all the way up to like geometric languages. And the push forward is where you need some sort of finiteness assumption. Maybe it's compact Lie group in, in geometric languages, or sorry, complex reduction group. Maybe it's finite group if you're doing Dijkraaf Witten here. But we're going to use, you know, we're, we're going to need um, a finite group here. And this is why. So to summarize, we build. We, we sort of take our theory and we, and we say, okay, given a manifold, consider all the principal bundles and the space thereof. And the classical theory defines a vector bundle on that. And then we're going to look at the space of sections and then use a push-pull construction to uh, obtain maps on spans.
uh, ready to go? Should we, uh, any questions? Okay. So first, what is a vector bundle over a group? So really this is a functor from X to complex vector spaces. And a line bundle is an invertible vector bundle, meaning it's valued in the, uh, the subcategory of invertible objects and morphisms. So, okay, what's actually, what's actually going on here is that to every object, we assign a vector space and to every, uh, which, which you think of as the fiber at, at that object. And to every morphism, we assign a linear map, which we're gonna, which we're gonna call parallel transport. So if your groupoid is the fundamental groupoid of a space that has a vector bundle on it, then calling these the fiber and the parallel transport are not actually bots. But we, we, we say it more generally, even if we just have some arbitrary group. Board. So a vector bundle has to have a space of sections, and the space of sections is the colon. And again, you know, this corresponds to actual spaces of sections of actual vector bundles. Um, for a line bundle, though, the space of sections is the... Um, so, sorry. So I should say that since we have parallel transport maps, the space of sections of a vector bundle corresponds to, if we're doing this over spaces, we would say the space of flat sections with respect to the, the connection induced by those parallel transports. But we're on groupoids, we're gonna forget about connections, life, life is happy, and we, get, we, we just have space of sections. Now for a line bundle, the space of sections is, and this is sort of an exercise fact thing, the space of sections is free on the subset of isomorphism classes of objects, such that all parallel transport maps act by the identity. So a non-identity parallel transport from X to itself obstructs a section because the only way that you could, that you could map up and commute with parallel transport is to be zero. But all the places where parallel transport is trivial, you get a one-dimensional, you know, you get a one-dimensional contribution. So now we're gonna build the category of correspondences. So the objects are uh, groupoids with vector bundles. And we're gonna require these groupoids to be finite. So some people care about, some people say that finite is, you know, in category theory, people try not to talk about notions that are um, invariant under equivalence of categories. For example, you don't wanna say literally a finite number of objects um, because they're, you know, that, that is not, like, that, that's not a good notion. So the end I've called this evil, which is, I mean, I think there is better wording. And, um, but, but certainly we'd like to, we'd like to make notions of uh, category theory and group, groupoid theory that are behave, well behaved under equivalence. So when I say a groupoid is finite, that does not mean finitely many objects and finitely many morphisms. That means finitely many isomorphism classes of objects and all automorphism groups are finite. So this is, this is this, um, this finiteness is, is another thing that requires us to use finite groups. So a morphism in core is several pieces of data. First, it's a span of groupoids. So we have a groupoid mapping to both of these things. So a morph this is a morphism from X1 to X2. Additionally, we want a vector bundle on X1, a vector bundle on X2, and a map from the space of sections here to the space of sections here. So linear map. And so the idea is we're going to use, you know, um, if you want to, um, oh yeah, okay. So again, you know, th that data forms a, uh, a groupoid. And so we're gonna take isomorphism classes of this data. So we have a category of correspondences rather than a two category. Sometimes you'll want to care about the higher categorical stuff and I am not doing that today, but just it, it's there, it may be useful. And right now it's not. So composition being associative on the nose is a good thing. You know, we want this to be a category. So we take isomorphism classes of this data. Um, so the identity is the uh, correspond is this correspondence with the vector bundle maps the identity, and then composition is given two correspondences. You'll have, you know, so x one to x two, and then x two to x three. You have this map and this map, and they pull back to something, and that's the uh, pullback correspondence. Finally, symmetrical modal structure is disjointly unique, and so this gives us a symmetrical modal category of correspondences. Any questions so far? Okay. So we're going to build the first functor, which is sort of the space, you know, the space of fields. And so we start with our Z classical. And so given a um, given an n minus one manifold, 
who are going to assign the groupoid of principal G bundles. And so because M is compact and G is finite, this is, this is a finite groupoid. So um, why is this? Okay, maybe that's a good thing to think about, but it's a, it's a reasonable algebraic topology fact. And in particular, okay, so we want a vector bundle. And that vector bundle is going, you know, I mentioned that's a, that's a functor. And it's going to be send a principal bundle to Z classical evaluator on M and P. And okay, well, what's the parallel transform map? An automorphism principal bundles gives us a bordism, which we call the mapping cylinder. And that defines a linear map from Z classical MP to Z classical MP. And then voila, that's our parallel transform map. Great, so that's the uh, vector bundle. And now a bordism from M0 to M1, which uh, I'm calling X, induces these maps, you know, these, these inclusion maps. It's a co-span. And therefore, it induces pullback maps, a span, a correspondence of principal G bundles. And so we therefore need, so we want, so, so that gives us part of the data. We also need that, that uh, element of the, of the space of section, maps between sections. And we're going to choose the one that comes from applying Z classical to this bordism X. So that's a little bit, okay, a little bit is going on under the hood. The idea is that if I pick principal, a pick principal bundle on X, then I get, um, or yeah, okay. So there's a little going on under the hood there, but we, uh, we apply Z classical to this, to this bordism with some principal G bundle. And using that, we can obtain, um, we can think of that as, okay, well, how does that, when the principal bundle restricts to M0 and M1, how does that define us a, uh, a matrix, like sort of a, acting by some sort of matrix multiplication? Um, hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have questions. Okay, so the second functor is what's called quantization. Um, people mean lots of different things by like quantization. This is just one of them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the space of sections. Okay, I guess maybe I should say flat sections, whatever. And given a correspondence, we're going to act by this, this matrix. And then, okay, composition goes to composition, disjoint union goes to disjoint union, yay. So we have now defined the finite path integral. Cool. Um, before, I, before I talk about um, partition functions, let me check that there are no questions about this definition, because I did go a little bit fast. Hey, can I ask, so I, I missed what you're taking the co-limit over to get this space of sections. So a vector bundle over a groupoid is a functor from uh, that groupoid to vect. So we're taking the co-limit over, oh, okay. over the groupoid of principal G bundles. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, further questions? Okay. So what is the uh, partition function? So what you end up getting is the um this um for for a uh, closed end manifold what you end up getting is you sum over isomorphism classes of principal g bundles uh you you take the the partition function z classical weighted by the size of the automorphism group which is a finite group and so this pops up you know th this is th that that weight weighting it, it appears somewhere in that that choice of the of the matrix and that's and like you know choosing, like choosing data of automorphisms when you're when you're uh, going back and forth. I um, I wish I had said it more explicitly, but the truth is that I had what I thought was true, and then I went back and looked, and there was a mistake. So I corrected part of the previous slides, like yesterday and the day before. And if I had realized it earlier, I think it would have been a more transparent description. So sorry. But what you get, you know, even if you don't know the details of the construction, the partition function is integrate this function from principal bundle to to Z classical in the groupoid measure. So weighted by the number of automorphisms. So this is, this, is a, this is a measure that appears elsewhere in the world. This, the description of state spaces is a little more complicated. So it is the space of sections of a vector bundle on Bungie. That's the thing, you know, like I, I just mentioned. And so, so what is the fiber? The fiber is the uh, classical theory, Z classical. And the parallel transport, like I mentioned, is Z classical evaluated on the mapping torus of P. So M cross S1, and then the principal bundle is twisted by the automorphism. So the state space is therefore free on the set of isomorphism classes. Oh, ah, uh, okay. This is not literally true. It is true when Z classical is invertible. But um, so that we have a line bundle here, in general, it's gonna be slightly more complicated. Sorry about that. But 
if you have a if you have a if you have an invertible field theory z classical, then the state space is free on the set of isomorphism classes of principal G bundles, where the where these parallel transport maps or the 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 automorphisms induced by uh, automorphisms of principal bundles, those those are all trivial. And so in some sense, you're, you're cutting down your state space to something smaller. But for example, if you started with the, um, the trivial theory and then summed over principal G bundles, then the state space, you know, this, this condition is vacuous and the state space is just free on the set of isomorphism classes of principal G bundles. Uh, how are people feeling about this? Okay. So then I, wait, question. Yeah, do you only specify parallel transport for automorphisms? What about parallel transport? What about distinct bundles? Are you just canonically identifying them and saying that's basically... Well, so so the idea is that this groupoid, there are different components. Wait, sorry. Oh. Sorry, so yes, you're right. So 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 if I have two different bundles, then I can take the um, you know, I can take the mapping the uh, mapping cylinder for those um for for those like the map the board isn't between them. I guess I'm being I'm being a little bit imprecise and saying okay well this thing is I just choose isomorphism classes and that tells me right because if you know if a and b are isomorphic and you know the value of a section on a then you know the value of a section on b right because you you know that it has to commute with the parallel transport okay, thanks yeah wait sorry that wait did that did that answer your question yeah, that's good okay thanks. cool more questions okay. So what changes for the finite homotopy TFT? So um, basically, you replace groupoids with n groupoids, but rather, than, but you know, n groupoid is a is I mean, higher category theory is a lot to take in. So we're just going to think of it as the space of maps, where um, x you know has homotopy groups vanishing above degree degree n, and all the remaining ones are finite. So now we need that uh, Z classical defines a vector bundle with connection over the space of maps. And so the idea is that there's this there's this theorem that if you know the um if you know the parallel transports then you know the connection and so we get a connection great and so like I said parallel transport is given a bordism like given two fiber or sorry given two points in this mapping space there there a path between them corresponds to a bordism of the, the the manifolds of the map to x and so we can evaluate that z classical on that and get a linear map from the fiber here to the fiber here and that's our parallel transport map. And so partition functions now use the n groupoid cardinality. So what we do is we divide by the number of automorphisms, then we multiply by the number of two automorphisms, then we divide by the number of three automorphisms, then multiply by the number of four automorphisms, yada, 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 and then multiply by the, the value of the classical theory. And then sum this over isomorphism classes of maps to x. So conceptually similar, even if the details are a little scarier. So, um, okay, I think I already said this, that if we choose a, an R mod Z value cohomology invariant of a principal, of principal G bundles, or sorry, yeah, cohomology class of BG, then we can um, consider the exponent, so we can consider this, this alpha as like a classical action for principal G bundles. And we can integrate it to obtain an element of R mod Z, great. Now, let's exponentiate that, and then, and then, Perform the finite path integral just like we did for path integral quantization of physics, but this is this is now a, an actual topological field theory, and it's called dygraph witten theory for G and alpha. And then I mentioned you get Quinn's finite homotopy TFT if you replace alpha of p with you know a more a more general invariant for um, maps to a space X. And again, if you know it's the Yetter model when when X is just has pi pi one and pi two. So. Dijkraff Witten theory again is the one that that is much more like this is a very a re quite common example in the world of TFT. So you'll, you, it's much more likely you'll see this again, and it's possible that you'll see these again. Um, before I change subject, uh, I'd like to pause for questions again. Could you just say a word about why this X can be thought of as a higher group? Or well, maybe if that's off topic. Just... Which this thing? Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, when, when you say two, when I say two group, like what, what, what is a two group to you? I don't know. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, a group is a, a, so one definition of a two group is a category object in groups. So it's something, or I'm sorry, a group object in categories. Well, okay. Those, those turn out to be equivalent, but that's not true. So it's not just a set of, you know, a, a set with a multiplication. It's something like a category with multiplication. So we have G, you know, the isomorphism class of objects with its multiplication. 
And then we also have automorphisms of the unit, which are the identity. And that turns out to, it always has to be an abelian group by Ekman Hilton. And so in some sense, you've got G at level zero and A at level one. And so whatever the heck this thing, and then they mix somehow. That, that's the data of a two group. And so whatever, whatever the heck this is, it, it has a classifying space. And that classifying space is a, um, so the classifying space of a group only has pi one. The classifying space of a two group has pi one and pi two, which should be G and A. So in substance, you can think of like, if you, if you just do Postnikov theory and you kill everything above pi one, you get a KG one or the classifying space of a group. If you kill everything above pi two, you have pi one, pi two, and that's the classifying space of a two group. And then you can continue on and on and on. So in some sense, an n group is, is somehow a group object in n minus one categories, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I know that's true for n equals two. And so um, and so we should expect that that has data of you know things up to level n, min n minus one. And therefore, the classifying space is homotopy groups in degrees one through n. And so that's that's maybe why maybe this is helpful words. I don't know. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, we can chat more about it sometime. Uh, more questions? OK, I'm now going to talk about some applications of the finite path unit rule. These things are not super well known and are also not written down really anywhere. Um, I'll give references as I can. But a lot of this is stuff that you know I read, like, is re I read in physics papers, and it's clear how it would turn into math. And I, and I discussed with someone else who confirmed that I'm not hallucinating things, but that that turn has not that that turning into math has not been done. So first is a procedure called bosonization and or fermionization. Um, these are big words for what they actually are, and they're they're good Scrabble words unless you know if you if you use UK English, then this then the Z becomes an S, and now it is worth less points. So the idea is that there's this thing in StatMet called the jordan wigner transform, uh, most notably used to solve the Easing model. And so what you do is it's this formal change of variables, if you're, which doesn't really make a lot of sense like locally, but, but it, it turns a bosonic system with a Z2 symmetry into a fermionic system. And you, know, you can also go backwards. And this is helpful because sometimes one, one side is easier than the other. So we're going to build an analog for 2D uh, for 2D topological field theory. So 1D is space and 2D is space time, so that's fine. And on one side is the, is the bosonic system with the Z2 symmetry, oriented TFTs with the principal Z2 bundle. And on the other side is fermionic systems, so spin TFTs. Uh, here I should say something, something spin statistics, the relationship between fermionic things and spin is not a theorem in, in like topological field theory. Okay. And this thing, so th this, this procedure, which exchanges these two kinds of TFTs, is a Fourier transform. Now, there, were, there are people who tell you every duality is a Fourier transform, but this like actually looks like a Fourier transform. And I'll tell you some stuff about that. So our reference for this is there are some papers of uh, Anton Kapustin and Ryan Thorngren. So I think a couple papers with the two of them, and then uh, Ryan Thorngren has a couple on his own that say some stuff like this. But um, I mean, I know that Ryan knows how to turn it into a theorem. He just hasn't done. So, um, so first, we're, we're going to think of this. So the, the Fourier transform, you can think of as a kernel transform. You like pull back to, um, to like functions on R X R T cross R X I. You you uh, hit it with a kernel and then you integrate. So we're going to do something similar here, where we pull back to a theory which requires both a spin structure and a principal Z two bundle. We hit it with a kernel and then we integrate. The kernel is an invertible field theory, which therefore makes it easy to define. So first, recall um, recall is doing a lot of work here. So if if this is new, sorry. Um, but spin, let's say you pick an orientation of a, of a space, of a manifold. Spin structures which induce that orientation are a torsor for Z2 cohomology. And it's not just that. It's like you can, given a spin structure and a principal Z2 bundle, there's a way to tensor them together into a new spin structure. Uh, and so I'm going to call that S plus P. Usually I would denote spin structures math frac S, but too many al math alphabets and version normals, my arch nemesis. So, okay, so that's the first fact that, that we can, you know, we can shift spin structures using principles in two bundles. Again, you may you may look at this may have something to do with like you know you, when you shift the thing you exponentiate in your Fourier transform. Okay. Second, there is the ARF invariant of a spin surface is a complete in, is is a complete Bordism invariant valued in plus minus one. This uh, again this may be, if you're used to like spin geometry this is probably not new, 
But if you aren't, uh, sorry. So there, there, there's different ways of thinking about this. Uh, we can chat about it later. And third, remember, as I mentioned, a Bordesman invariant list to an invertible TFT value in S factor. So therefore, there is an invertible TFT, the Jordan Wigner kernel, which is defined on two manifolds of the spin structure and a principal Z2 bundle, is valued in super vector spaces. And the partition function says, given a spin structure and a principal Z2 bundle, use the principal Z2 bundle to shift the spin structure and then take the ARF invariant. So um, if you're familiar with the ARF topological field theory, this is sort of a shifted version of that. OK, so this is an invertible TFT, and it's a jordan Wigner kernel. Any questions right now? OK. So now we're going to, so given a spin TFT ZF, let's a uh, 2D spin TFT, we're going to bosonize it. So here's what we do. First, tensor with the jordan Wigner kernel. What we've obtained now is a 2D TFT on spin manifolds of the principal Z2. So let's perform the finite path integral over spin structures, which induce the, the, uh, the same orientation. So you can do this. It turns out that you know, the, the, the groupoid of spin structures on a, on a uh, compact manifold is always finite, um, which has to do with the fact that it's an H1Z2 torsor. And so what we obtain only depends on an orientation and a principal Z2 bundle. And so that is what's called the bosonization of ZF. It, we, we used up the spin structure and ended up with, this, with an extra Z2, principal Z2 bundle. So you can also go in reverse. Given a, uh, an SO, an oriented 2D TFT with a principal Z2 bundle, ZB, we can fermionize by tensoring with the Jordan Wigner kernel and then performing the finite path integral over Z2 bundles. Now, these are not quite inverses. Just like the Fourier transform, if you do it naively, is not quite, you know, Fourier squared is not one. There's this, um, if you do one of these and then the other, you get uh, to, to get back where you started. It's amounting, it amounts to tensoring with an Euler theory. So, you know, the, the partition function is an Euler character, like something to the Euler characteristic. And so you can make that Euler theory go away. You know, you just it's invertible, so you can invert it. Great. It's very much like the factor of 2 pi in the Fourier transform. It's harmless, and you can, you can sweep it under the rug, but you can't make it entirely go away. So here's a couple of interesting facts about this. Um, some of these facts are theorems. Some of these facts are um, things stated in physics papers. Some of these are probably true that I, that like have been discussed verbally, but do not appear in print. So, you know, Bourbaki dangerous bend sign. So the usual, so, okay. One important feature of Fourier transform like objects or like Fourier transform like constructions is that pointwise multiplication on one side should be exchanged with convolution on the other. And indeed the usual tensor product on topological field theories, if you trace it through this, it does look like a convolution. Again, this is in this paper of Ryan Thornton. Um, second, and this, I don't know if this has a Fourier theoretic analog. If ZF doesn't depend on the spin structure, so it's just an oriented TFT, and I've said, aha, a spin structure induces an orientation. So we just, it's, it's a spin TFT in a trivial way. So for that ZF, ZB doesn't depend on the principal Z2 bundle. And in fact, they're isomorphic. And the, the corresponding, the, the converse statement is true. A, a, a TFT which doesn't depend on a principal Z2 bundle is just an oriented TFT. When you fermionize, it doesn't depend on the spin structure and you get back what you started with. So that's, that's kind of neat. And moreover, some people care about extended TFT. And so let's say I work in the, in the uh, Merida 2 category. So 2 is fully extended in this dimension, which is a nice fact, of complex super algebras. So Z2 graded algebra is Z2, grade, um, Z2 graded bimodules, bimodule whole works, and super tensor products. So then, the Jordan Wigner kernel extends and, and the finite path integral still makes sense. So you can just do the same thing. And, um, and again, the fact is that, you know, going, bosonizing then fermionizing or fermionizing then bosonizing is almost the same thing as the identity. And you can make it, you know, you can get rid of the discrepancy. So that's one thing. And finally, the Jordan Wigner kernel can be extended to unoriented TFTs as follows. So the ARF invariant extends to a thing called the um, ARF Brown or ARF Brown Kerver invariant of pin minus manifolds, which is now valued in Z mod eight. And um, you can shift pin minus structures by a Z2 bundle again. So using, so using the analog of the shifted ARF theory, the shifted ARF Brown theory, you can set up this bosonization fermionization duality between unoriented TFTs with the principal Z2 bundle in dimension two and 2D pin minus TFTs. So, this is a thing which, again, is, is known, but like elucidating the structure, even proving this is an equivalence, especially in the unoriented case, just like, you know, it's a big wide world out there. This is open. Well, open, but no. 
So, um, and then once you have that, you might be able to use it to study 2D TFT. So that's, that's something. Um, before I talk about the next example, do people have questions about this one? Okay, so next example is direct sums. So direct sums I've met in the, um, what's the word? In the usual, um, like there's this usual construction of direct sums of TFTs, for example, in Shariah's book, it's very hands-on. And it's, di it's difficult to generalize if you care about say extended topological field theories. So um, th the issue is that Pointwise tensor product always makes sense, but direct sum, you know, if you just define it naively by, by this formula, it is not symmetric and noidal. So on a disconnected manifold, you do this on all connected components and then tensor it together. And then similarly for bordisms, on connected bordisms, it's actually direct sum, and then elsewhere you use symmetric and noidal stuff. And so you can think about how you might generalize this to other settings, but it's kind of, you know, checking things or TFTs is kind of messy. So we're going to use the finite path integral to simplify our lives. So let's consider the space with two points. This certainly has finite total homotopy. So that's good. And so what we're going to do is given two different TFTs, we're going to build a new TFT on manifolds with a map to uh, this two-point space as follows. So the function to the two-point space is locally constant. So wherever it's equal to 1, assign z1. And wherever it's equal to 2, assign z2. And so, OK, you have to check that this is a TFT, but it is. And now you can perform the finite path integral over maps of this two-point space, and what do you get if not the direct sum? And this, this generalizes to settings that the, that the uh, ad hoc definition does not. Uh, any questions about this example? OK, so the last example I'm going to say very quickly, and then I'll be done. And then uh, I, hopefully you, you all have questions. So the finite path integral has this interpretation from the physics perspective as gauging a G symmetry. For a finite abelian group, there's this process called ungaging, which again appears in the physics literature and does not appear to have care been carefully written down in, in, in a mathematics perspective. Though I think uh, uh, it's Leon Liu says that Lurie has something related to this. So the idea is, you know, gauging you know, classical theory of quantum theory. If G is abelian, you can go backwards. And I'm, I'm going to be vague, but it, it's it's a similar Fourier Fourier theoretic description as bosonization fermionization, where you tensor with a kernel, and then you know sum over sum over the your, your bundles. But on one side, we have an oriented theory with the principal Z2 or oriented manifold, sorry, principal Z2 bundles. And on the other side, or sorry, oriented manifolds with principal A bundles, not Z2. And on the other side, we take the character dual and we take a higher bundle. So we want something which has a degree n minus one cohomology class. So the kernel was some, it uh, refines a borders invariant given a principal bundle and an element of, uh, you know, a dual degree n minus one cohomology. Take your characteristic class, H1, A cohomology, cut product them together. Now you're in A tensor A dual degree N cohomology. The evaluation pairing gets you in C star valued cohomology. And then, um, and then uh, integrate, and you obtain an element of C star, and that's your borders invariant. So this defines this procedure of gauging and ungauging. I just realized this C should be a C star. Sorry about that. So um, I'll go ahead and stop here. Uh, do people have any questions? This is far fetched, but this bosonization from immunization, is there a way in, the, in which one side is like the A side and the other is the B side or like spectral and automorphic? Good question. Um, not that I know of. Okay. You, should have, uh, you should ask David or maybe post in the bizarre chat and see what he says. But um, the problem is that like we don't have two different groups. We have like Z2 and spin. But I do like that question. Um, more, more questions? Okay. In that case.